the American attempt to use its economic and, and particularly military power to spread what it considers its political system when it uses force and economic compulsion. I think that it's going to fail. And this is, I may not, I undoubtedly won't live long enough to uh, see the, uh, the consequences, but I do worry about my grandchildren. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal, and today I have the extraordinary privilege of talking again to Ambassador Jack Matlock, a true legend of U.S. diplomacy, I have to say that. Ambassador Matlock was born in 1929, educated at Duke and Columbia Universities. He entered the Foreign Service in 1956 and went all the way to become U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union from 1987 to 1991. Uh, with his duties in Moscow ending only months before the dissolution of the country itself. He was famously working with President Reagan and Bush Sr. to end the Cold War, which he keeps emphasizing happened due to mutual agreement and good diplomacy, not because of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I talked to Ambassador Matlock once before in early February 2020, 22, right before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and things have, of course, only gotten worse since then. But recently he wrote another very important piece in American diplomacy entitled The Christmas Gift That Keeps Giving, in which he argues that the U.S. today is doing what the USSR used to do under the so-called Brezhnev Doctrine. This is what we want to discuss today. So, Ambassador Matlock, thanks for joining me again. Glad to be with you today. Ambassador, I'm going to ask you now a very wide question, actually three, um, in order to give you time to, to expand on that. But um, what was the Brezhnev Doctrine? Why did the U.S. receive it at a, as a Christmas gift, or in what sense? And why do you think it is a poison chalice, as you argue in the essay? Yes. Well, what I tried to explain in the article was something that happened along time ago in uh, 1989 and uh, this um, it happened as the Cold War was ending and Eastern Europe was being liberated uh, for the most part easily well in December of that year uh, the, our President Bush uh, the first President Bush met with uh, Soviet President Gorbachev. They met in Malta and they made an agreement of number one, uh, that the Cold War was over. And the, number two, that the Soviet Union would not leave, but not use force in Eastern Europe if there were political changes there. And then uh, that the United States would not take advantage of the situation in Eastern Europe. Uh, this was a few months before when we were discussing German unification, the unification of East Germany and West Germany, where the Secretary of State uh, said uh, that uh, if uh, the East Germany uh, who was uh, would uh, be united with West Germany uh, that there would be no expansion of NATO uh, to the east. Now, uh, but I put this in context. Now, as I was thinking about the situation today, it brought me back to the Christmas Eve in nineteen. In uh, uh, Christmas Eve 1989, uh, when I was instructed to go to the foreign ministry, to the deputy foreign minister in Moscow who was responsible for Eastern Europe. And the reason was that there, a revolution had broken out in Romania. <laughs> 
a very bloody one. And the uh, the uh, the I was instructed to go in and to get their assessment of what was going on there. Perfectly normal, you know, diplomacy. And then before then the appointment was made on the December twenty fourth, the next day, which happened to be Christmas Eve. Uh, now, it happened that uh, I would say unrelated, perhaps, uh, but uh, in the middle of December, the United States had attacked Panama in order to arrest Noriega, who was a drug lord, and uh, uh, we needed to bring him to justice. And politically, that was important because the treaty was coming up before the Senate to approve the transfer of the Panama Canal to Panama. It had been controlled directly by the United States for decades. And uh, it was important if Noriega was left unarrested uh, that the Senate probably wouldn't ratify that treaty. So that was important. But in any event, let me describe what the Brezhnev Doctrine is. It's been a long time ago. Well, the Brezhnev Doctrine developed, uh, it was first developed uh, in the West to describe Soviet policy. And uh, it happened when the Soviet Union and the other Warsaw Pact countries invaded uh, uh, first Hungary, in the 1950s and then Czechoslovakia to when they they said there was a threat to socialism. The doctrine was that if a country had become what they called socialist, which meant communist dominated, that any that if there was any threat to that socialism, it was the duty of other socialist countries to come and defend socialism. In other words, they had a right to invade, uh, to uh, defend. Now, this uh, this was on the basis of a Marxist-Leninist doctrine. After all, Marx and then Lenin had predicted that the proletarian revolution would extinguish the bourgeoisie and would create a uh, a classless society that would live in peace and would gradually go from socialism, which they said the, the, in socialism, each receives what each contributes. In communism, each receives what one needs, uh, what each needs. Uh, those were the philosophical distinctions. Of course, none of the countries had really reached that uh, goal of communism, though they were ruled by parties that call themselves communist parties. So the idea was history was history was moving in that direction. And in fact, although uh, a lot of the ideology had, was no longer really taken that seriously, this did affect the, the thinking of the Soviet leaders. When in their first meeting, uh, President Reagan asked Gorbachev, uh, well, actually, what what he he criticized the Soviet support for revolutions in Latin America and in Africa, and Gorbachev, in effect, said, "Look, this is just history working out. It's the end of colonialism. It's going to happen. You might as well get used to it." Now, Gorbachev changed his mind later on that point, very much so, but. My point is that the idea was the future is going to be socialist and then communist because that's how the world is headed. Uh, and uh, so that was the basis. Now, may, may, uh, I, may I just ask, and you, you also, you think that the, those leaders like Gurmikov and so on, who were still all uh, born and, and, and educated under early uh, socialism, that they truly believed this. They really believed in this dogma, right? That's the point. I think, uh, you know, I think they really did. 
Uh, now, I think they also, they were also really operating more uh, from the standpoint of realpolitik in action, but they would justify it that way and would say, look, you know, this is, uh, this is not something uh, against you. And as a matter of fact, if we're speaking of the philosophy, although from Khrushchev on, uh, they talked about the coexistence, but it was always the coexistence of countries of different social systems. In other words, we can live at peace with countries that are not what we call socialist or communist dominated. But it means that there could be intervention if it was the, the, a country of the same social system. So this was something a lot of people missed, you know, in the ideology. Coexistence, yes, that's what everybody wants. But when they put the full formula in, it was only coexistence between what they call socialist countries and capitalist countries. Socialist countries had the right under that to intervene in uh, each other's countries, really meaning the Soviet Union had the right to intervene uh, if they thought there was a threat to socialism. So uh, that uh, so that uh, that was that point. Now, anyway, I was instructed to, uh, in the background of this, I had received a telegram instructing me to go and inquire about their view of what was happening in Romania. But then I got a telephone call on the class on my classified line, which said, "Now, when you talk to him, please let them know that if they have to use some military force in Romania, if, for example, their their citizens are threatened and they have to extricate them, the president, that is President Bush, would not consider this a violation of their agreement." You see, they had agreed earlier in December uh, that uh, that Gorbachev would not intervene in 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 Eastern Europe, and I told the person who called, "Well, I don't see how I can bring that up without it seeming <laughs> that uh, I'm encouraging it." But of course, I will if, if that's what the Secretary of State wants. So when I actually brought that up rather delicately, uh, the Deputy Minister, whose name was uh, Ivan Aboimov, uh, suddenly was very angry, obviously thinking about the fact that we had intervened in Panama just two weeks after the meeting when Gorbachev had told them they wouldn't intervene in Eastern Europe. And he simply said, uh, 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 there is uh, the, the Brezhnev. We, the Brezhnev doctrine, no longer applies for us. Uh, we give it to you as a Christmas present. As I said, this was December twenty fourth. Well, at the time, I thought this was a rather clever, you know, uh, thing. One thing I I didn't think the. Panama thing was going to last very long, and certainly we had strong political reasons uh, in the interest of Panama itself to get that Panama Canal treated. But actually, it took over a month, and it wasn't over until the end of January. All right, we'll fast forward. And uh, after the Cold War ended, there began to be, I would say, several misperceptions on the part of most Americans, in fact, most Europeans also, and I suppose Asians, uh, it seemed to be sort of worldwide, that uh, the, the US or the West won the Cold War as if it was a quasi-military victory, uh, and, uh, and that, uh, uh, in effect, the uh, Soviet Union was defeated. And then this carried over after the Soviet Union broke up uh, to be that, well, Russia was defeated. 
Well, these were all basic misperceptions. We had negotiated an end to the Cold War uh, 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 to the interest of everybody. It was as much in the interest of the Soviet Union as it was in the United States and its NATO allies. And as far as the breakup of the Soviet Union, the United States did not want that to happen. Yes, we wanted the three Balkan countries to regain their independence. And I might say that one of the last acts of the Soviet State Council was to approve their independence. Uh, so uh, they they didn't get their independence because of the breakup of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union legalized that before it broke up. And that's something also to remember. Uh, but uh, so, and I would say that actually the breakup of the Soviet Union was a defeat for American policy uh, because President Bush wanted uh, the Gorbachev to succeed in creating a voluntary, more democratic federation. And he thought all of the non-Baltic republics would be better off maintaining sort of an association with each other as long as it was voluntary. Of course, that was not to happen. And it's very interesting, people who constantly accuse Russia of always doing uh, harm uh, to its neighbors, that it was the elected president of the Russian Federation who led the breakup of the Soviet Union. This was not something the United States, or for that matter, its NATO allies sought at that time. And as a matter of fact, President Bush gave a uh, speech uh, September 2nd, uh, 19, uh, 91, he flew to, he gave a speech to the Ukrainian Rada uh, on September 2nd, uh, 1991. He had flown from Moscow to Kiev. I flew on the plane with him. And in that speech, he appealed to the Ukrainians to join Gorbachev's voluntary union. And he warned against what he called suicidal nationalism. Now, at the time, we were thinking about what was happening in Soviet Georgia, where there had been violence within Georgia uh, against some of its minorities. Uh, but uh, in any event, it was not U.S. policy to try to break up the Soviet Union. Now, when it became clear, and as that went, uh, the year went on, that it was going to happen, of course, uh, we had to accept it and and actually establish embassies in all of the uh, the former fifteen republics, uh, but uh, it was not something that uh, we sought. Okay, now on the ideological side, uh, let's fast forward a little bit. Now, Marxism, Leninism, and the Brezhnev doctrine that uh, that drew out of it. Uh, uh, was supposed to be an inevitable course of history, uh, that uh, it was inevitable that there would be a, a revolution and that uh, uh, this all the states would become this. Well, in 1993, this is two years after the Soviet Union broke up, uh, Francis Fukuyama, who is a, a political scientist and philosopher, uh, uh, wrote a very interesting, first an article and then a book. And uh, it was uh, in, in that there was this key paragraph. What we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Russian liberal democracy as the final form of human government. The final form of human government. The end of history. You know, that prediction that any present system could be the final form of human government 
was a breathtaking allegation, and as I wrote, totally void of any supporting historical fact. It was just as fanciful as Karl Marx's prediction that a proletarian revolution would result in a world free of competing classes, government compulsion, and strife. Yet it led to a presumption that the United States could use its military and economic power to transform other societies into democracies with capitalist economies that were free, would be free to live in peace with one another. The goal came to be called the liberal world order. And I noted in the article the following correspondences. Under the Brezhnev doctrine, the ability and duty of the Soviet Union and its allies to spread and defend what they call socialism from internal or external threats. In the liberal world order, which is sometimes called now the rules-based order, uh, the ability and duty of the United States and its allies to spread and defend democracy, I'll put that in quotes, from internal or external threats. Now, the basic problem here is, and there's a very basic problem other than <laughs> no, no evidence in history, uh, is that uh, they, in neither case did the sponsor of the Brezhnev Doctrine and the liberal world order define precisely what they meant by socialism or democracy. In practice, only nation states they dominated were considered to meet the necessary criteria. So I think on the basis of that, it did seem to me that instead of in the 1990s of leading, uh, leading the world to create a security structure that that ensured every country's security. Now that the Soviet Union had broken up, as I said, under the instigation of Russia, by the way, because if Russia had not supported that breakup, it would not have happened. Uh, and uh, this, that's the fact of the matter. Uh, but uh, in, in any event, the, uh, the, this left, I think, the opportunity since the United States did emerge as by far the most powerful militarily and the most productive economically uh, of the, uh, in the world at that time. We were practically invulnerable to attack by any other country. Uh, later, the terrorist attack was, uh, was not by a country. Uh, and it, of course, was limited, horrible as it was. But uh, the fact is that what I believe we should have done was in Europe to uh, develop a security system uh, that ensured everybody. Instead, we started expanding NATO. Now, I testified before the U.S. Senate strongly against that. And in fact, I said at the time, if we start this, and if it continues having in mind not just to the borders of the former Soviet Union, but even perhaps including some countries that were in the Soviet Union, that this could be a disastrous course politically. Because it was clear to me, and I must say almost every one of the senior people who negotiated the end of the Cold War, that this was the wrong way to go. Uh, Russia at that point was extremely weak. It was trying to trying to create a, a capitalist economy after having a state-controlled economy, and it ended up in something close to anarchy. And uh, since many of the people said they were democratizing, uh, most Russians began to, to doubt uh, democracy, and the, uh, they, they really looked at it as simply the seizure of, of of the state assets by a handful of people. Uh, those that became the oligarchs. 
So it was not a good advertisement for democracy. And yet uh, um, many in the West and the United States and in Europe and actually uh, saw this as, uh, as a very positive development. But Russia being very weak, it was obvious that if we start expanding NATO, and and at first I must say, the uh, the uh, Russian leaders uh, they didn't like it, but they accepted it. Uh, and uh, uh, I I recall being in New York when President Putin came on a visit, and at that time they were asking about uh, the adhesion of the three Baltic countries to NATO. At that point, uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary had already entered. And uh, he said, well, he didn't see the need for that. But on the other hand, uh, that uh, that's fine, as long as we don't put bases there. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing people tend to forget, is that, uh, is that w- when we did the treaty uh, for East Germany to join West Germany, it's actually stated in the treaty that uh, although it doesn't forbid East Germany becoming part of NATO, it forbids placing any non-German troops or bases in that territory. And obviously, we're not going to do it there. I recall then the Russian ambassador uh, to Moscow, uh, whom I had known, he was the deputy minister uh, of foreign affairs in the Soviet Union. Uh, and in fact, the, he and I had negotiated the last paragraphs of the treaty for the Soviet Union to leave Afghanistan. But he, I know he came to me in one of our meetings and said, you know, it's not your title five that we're worried about. We're not going to attack them. But what is sensitive is putting bases there. And, and uh, of course, uh, we began, uh, uh, we, we began gradually after having no bases to talk about bases. And then, of course, in the year 2000, uh, with the second Bush administration, we began unilaterally to step out of all, each of the arms control agreements we had negotiated. It took us neg- decades to negotiate those, and we simply walked out of them, particularly the anti-ballistic missile treaty, the so-called ABM treaty. Now, that was legal because the treaty said you could give six months notice and leave it, but it it pulled sort of the, the basis out of many of the arms control agreements we had. And uh, then... I think what was particularly sensitive for uh, President Putin was the plan to establish uh, uh, to establish anti-ballistic missile bases in Eastern Europe, in Poland and, and Romania. Uh, now, this is, one can say, why should he worry about that? Well, the fact is that the ABM system we were using was adapted from one that well, on American cruisers, which can, with a change of software, carry either defensive or offensive missiles. So obviously this was an issue. Now we said, well, we have to do this to keep Iran from attacking Western Europe. Frankly, that made no sense. Iran wasn't threatening Western Europe. And uh, so I, I need not go through, you know, so many of these steps. I was writing about it at the time. And, uh, but in any event, uh, this, uh, now our excuse uh, increasingly for intervention, uh, military intervention elsewhere, uh, was uh, uh, that uh, uh, we had an obligation to protect minorities and others, and if they were being, uh, if they were being uh, victimized in some fashion, uh, uh, we should uh, protect them. 
Uh, and that was one thing. But the basic thing was that the idea was that we really had an obligation to spread democracy. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the, uh, then nobody thought about, well, how do you spread democracy? You certainly can't do it by military force. After all, if democracy means rule by and for the people, an outsider can't do it. And the people in each country have to develop it their way. And frankly, they're most likely to do it if we set a good example. And I would say, you know, we haven't been setting a great example in these recent years in the United States for how our democracy operates. But basically, there was the uh, 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 this tended to be the excuse. Now, let me say that now that I think people really believe this. That they were not lying. They were not, you know, they really believed it. It's just that I think they were believing the wrong thing. And uh, uh, so uh, that's, in effect, what uh, I have to say. And then it seems that, you know, the liberal world order, uh, it was not certainly orderly. We had war after war and problem, nor was it particularly liberal. And the problem was the attempt to use military force, particularly outside military force, uh, for things which could not be really corrected uh, that way. And uh, so uh, it did seem to me And I pointed out in the article that, uh, you know, after all, the United States evaded Iraq, which had not threatened him, and had not been a source of of terrorism. It had a a government that, you know, was very hard on some of its minorities. But... uh, uh, and we invaded it and removed the entire government and set le- loose, uh, uh, set loose the ISIS and uh, even greater terrorism. Uh, and uh, now we also invaded Afghanistan, but in that case we had UN approval. Mm-hmm. In the case of Iraq, we did not, and we even cited evidence that. I'm sure the people who cited it thought it was true, but it turned out to be false. And uh, as the uh, uh, as the reason, now uh, we say now, oh, we have to oppose Russia b- because Russia invaded Ukraine. Well, I think that's a horrible thing, and I, you know. The, the damage and the people who are dying and being maimed from that is a tremendous tragedy. However, I would simply say that that didn't have to happen because I think what President Putin asked for was simply a guarantee that we would not take Ukraine, which had been, whether you think he's exaggerating the extent or not, it had been, uh, most of it, a part of Russia for centuries. Now, the part which is leading most of the government now in the West was not in Russia. It had been in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and in Poland. And the irony there is that the borders of Ukraine, which the current Ukrainian government is insisting they must restore, was created by St- Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. The addition of the Crimea was simply a paper uh, uh, transfer uh, by Nikita Khrushchev. And the thing is that the uh, the the thing is this is a true tragedy. It didn't have to happen. Of course, it's a horrible thing that he invaded. But is that any worse than the? the uh, George the second George Bush invasion of Iraq I mean uh, let's let, let's let's try to be fair about those things and I think that what it has turned out to be 
is that uh, 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 the United States is very much overcommitted its resources and is dealing with these issues in the wrong way. And then we get the now the the real contradiction in that while we condemn the process of genocide that's going on in Gaza now, we're providing all of the arms and and political cover. And uh, yeah, uh, to uh, to carry it out. Now this this is of course a total contradiction to what our policy should have been. And may I, may I ask you? Do you think that these contradictions that now are emerging? There were contradictions emerging in the Soviet Union uh, in the in the 60s, 70s, 80s between what the ideology was and what reality was. And what we are seeing now is a huge contradiction of the last 30 years of what the ideology of liberal world order and rules based order is supposed to be and what it actually is. Do you see these as parallel developments? Well, I, I, I wouldn't see them as parallel. I think that I think that the people involved and at least most of them are are quite sincere. I think on both sides. I understood that at the time, uh, and uh, it's not that they're lying. Uh, no, uh, everybody is putting out a lot of propaganda, uh, and I would say, as far as uh, Russia and Ukraine is concerned, there hasn't been more out of Russia than there has been out of Ukraine. And certainly, when we look at the Near East, uh, we we see a lot of propaganda again uh, uh, coming out, uh, actually, of both sides there. So, the, when these conflicts begin, of course, the truth and so on, or even reality, the facts, are victims, uh, because people begin to look at everything with almost a tunnel vision. So, um, in any event, what I tried to say in the in the article was that uh, actually the American attempt to use its economic and and particularly military power to spread what it considers its political system when it uses force and economic compulsion. I think that it's going to fail, and this is, I may not, I undoubtedly won't live long enough to uh, see the, uh, the consequences, but I do worry about my grandchildren. Yes. yes and I... uh, this, because I think in the long run, it is going to be a very bad for the American people. We are overcommitted. We are fighting all these wars uh, and supporting all of this on borrowed funds. I mean, we now have a debt of over $23 trillion. And it's not just owed to Americans, it's known owed to many other countries as well. So that I think the whole attempt we have of using our dominant economic position, particularly in the financial sector, uh, as weapons, is going to come back to haunt us. And uh, I speak as a very loyal American and one who pledged my, uh, my work to carry out the terms of the American Constitution. It was not a, a loyalty oath to any individual. And I do think that our Congress is, tends to ignore some of the clear uh, conditions in the Constitution. We should not fight a war without a declaration of war. Mm -hmm. And we've not had one since the Second World War. May, may, may I ask you about your perception of the current ideological environment in the United States, but in the West in general, because you I, you were 12 when Pearl Harbor happened, and you have memories 
must have memories of of this this war period and then the cold war you were you were there ideologically speaking of of the level of propaganda that is going on are we are we near the propaganda and the and the also the ideological moment of mccarthyism or jazz freeman actually argued that the current situation in in the us and the west is close to mccarthyism or you know it's actually worse than mccarthyism would you agree with him on that or not well i think within the united states we are very sharply divided politically uh, and they too many people tend to put everything on a left right thing this is multidimensional and you know in foreign policy we find both conservatives and liberals who agree with me i mean i and then in fact usually the more conservative and libertarian a conservative is they're more apt to agree with me and i would say with the liberals i've always considered myself primarily sort of a moderate liberal or a moderate conservative because these issues get very mixed up but in foreign policy it just doesn't apply but internally we're very divided now and in my opinion both parties have failed us both of the principal political parties after all both of the most likely candidates uh, uh, for the presidency in the election this year both of them uh, are, have at most i would say maybe 41 percent approval mm -hmm. the majority of people don't want either one and yet our political system is one that is very likely going to produce a contest that nobody wants and uh, at the same time, uh, the, the country gets very divided sort of geographically with uh, the, the coasts, both coasts more democratic and much of the interior uh, Republican and so on. So, uh, so I think that uh, we have domestic problems we're gonna have to deal with. Will we deal with them? I think we will, but I think that uh, the over expenditure of resources on foreign affairs, trying to mix ourselves and other people's business, or taking one side or the other and what is a domestic astute, is simply the wrong way to go. And I hope we can at least gradually learn not to do that and start being the peacemaker rather than one who's constantly uh, taking sides. May I, maybe a last question, because it seems to me that over the past couple of years, uh, the last 30 years, the end of this, the, uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, or the collapse of the Soviet Union, the unipolar moment, the United States started started using even more military interventions we know even before that it happened i mean with 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 uh, chile and 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 so on i mean there were a lot of interventions but they became outright like war warfare war interventions and intervention in order to fo uh, foment more war now with ukraine we have seen this process uh in front of our eyes how things went from bad to worse to real war vladimir putin uh recently in in this interview with tucker carlson said that uh, the for ukraine to walk away from the istanbul agreements or the, the, the istanbul process was a tremendous mistake and that could have ended the war and you know a neutrality of ukraine and you and and and, and others have been saying neutrality for ukraine is the most obvious thing in the world and um, but that didn't happen because neocons in the United States uh, actually say that, no, this is not an option. Do you think that what's currently happening will bring the United States back to more realpolitik uh, in the sense of going away from ideology of spreading democracy or whatever it is uh, under disguise, under this disguise, than making war? Do you think it will it will now lead to more realpolitik again? Well, I think that actually, you know, our our policy has uh, has a dichotomy at part it's justified on uh, these ideological terms but in part it's also a realpolitik in the sense that uh, there seems to be 
and an idea that, well, it is in a country's advantage to extend its influence. Well, I think that as every empire has learned, there's nothing that weakens you more in the long run than trying to rule people who don't want you to rule them, number one. And uh, also that, uh, you know, outsiders, outsiders are usually not the best people to get involved in what you might call a family fight. And what's happening in Ukraine really is a family fight. It, it has all the psychological elements of of a civil war and uh the fact that you know that for the last 30 odd years there have been you know these independent countries we have to forget these were not orders the borders that were worked out over the centuries or that came down sort of sacred uh, uh they and that uh, uh the breakup of the Soviet Union meant that all of them were confronted with very difficult problems of, of moving to uh, a, a competitive uh, capitalist economy from a state-controlled economy, and, uh, and so on. These are very complex processes, and it's something that you know, an outsider uh, uh, cannot really help much if it takes one side or the other. Uh, the best you can do is to try to mediate perhaps and that should be the role i mean the sort of things that say the norwegians did uh you know uh, in the 1990s and almost brought about a two-state solution in uh in israel and palestine uh so uh the, but that type of diplomacy uh seems to have been dropped instead you sort of dividing the world between us and them and i think that is a big mistake i think so too which is why i call this channel neutrality studies because we need to study how to get back to that <laughs> <laughs> ambassador jack matlock thank you very much for your time today thank you thank you for the interview <laughs>